Talking tight here at the Voice of College Football. Appreciate you all being here and always enjoy the conversation with Gary Harris. Uh, he's the sports director at WVUA in Tuscaloosa. Also catch him on his show on Tide 100.9. Gary, it's been too long. How you doing? Doing great, Mark. Appreciate you having me on. I'm very sorry that we can't seem to get my camera uh, working and we're just having to use the avatar. We uh, we're both in the studio together, but uh, it's better, I guess, to look at this than to look at a black screen. So uh, my apology. Gary, fortunately for you, while you do have a face for TV, you also have a voice for radio. So you're the complete package. So it, it all works. You sound great. And uh, we appreciate you being here. Uh, I got to think that the buzz around Alabama football talk has to be this quarterback situation yeah. because on the surface, Gary, and I can't believe it's going to play out in terms of production like this. This looks to be the worst quarterback room that Alabama has had since. And it's almost difficult to compare the Greg McElroy, AJ McCarron days because so much, there was so much different asked of the quarterback at that spot, uh, based on what's expected now out of the, that position, you know, three right. or 4,000 yards and 35 touchdown passes, just kind of assess uh, where you think these quarterbacks stand currently Simpson, Milrow, Buckner. Yeah, Mark, I, you know, I, I agree with you. And then I, then I don't agree with you. I, I certainly think that it's an unproven quarterback room and based on the recent history. Yeah. You could certainly say it's, it's the worst quarterback room, but the, the good thing is that, and of course they've got two tr true freshmen as well. And Dylan Lonergan and Eli Holstein for down the road, but these three guys that are competing for the starting job, uh, Jalen Milrow, Ty Simpson, and the transfer from Notre Dame, Tyler Buckner, are all very talented, highly recruited quarterbacks. I mean, these are guys that uh, could have gone just about anywhere in the country. Uh, Ty Simpson was a five-star. Uh, Buckner was um, Tommy Reese and Brian Kelly's number one quarterback target out of San Diego when he came out of high school and signed with Notre Dame. And, of course, Jalen Milrow is, is arguably as you know, good a dual-threat quarterback in terms of athleticism as there is in the country. But you're right. They're all unproven. Uh, Buckner started three games last year. He started two uh, before he got hurt, and he came back and played in the bowl game against South Carolina and, and led Notre Dame to a, to a big victory. Milrow started one game in his career against Texas A&M. Alabama barely won that game. I did think he came in against Arkansas when uh, Bryce Young went down and, and played well, and then Ty Simpson's never played in a game, period, never taken a snap. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's where it stands. you got three quarterbacks that are battling for that starting position. Um, Coming out of spring, clearly uh, Alabama felt like that with Buckner that they wanted to add another quarterback into this mix. So that does tell you that Saban and Reese aren't sold on either Milrow or Simpson. Now, I'm not saying one of those guys won't be the starting quarterback because we don't know. I do think this, Mark, I, I, I think they brought in Tyler Buckner for a reason. Tommy Reese, as I said, recruited him very heavily out of high school to come to Notre Dame. So right now when we haven't even – you know, gotten to the summer, you know, workouts and fall camp still two months away. Uh, I give the inside track to Tyler Buckner. I just kind of think that's the way the tea leaves kind of stack up, but they'll all have to compete come August. Gary, you hit on when I became concerned about the situation, when Buckner was brought in, when Milrow was not named the starter, because I was thinking back two years, uh, Bryce Young, had like five pass attempts the previous season. Still, mm -hmm. I ranked him personally as the second best quarterback in the country. And people said, well, you're crazy. You've never seen him play. And I've said, well, yes, I can't evaluate his quarterback play at the collegiate level, but I just trust that if Nick Saban says a quarterback is our starting quarterback in spring practice, that he must be the guy. And he couldn't do the same with Jalen Milrow. Uh, so it, it's going to be fascinating uh, can you place any kind of odds on it at this point? I know that you said that you're expecting Buckner to win the job. How confident are you in that uh, prediction? Not a lot. If you give me odds, I, I, I'd probably say right now, uh, I'd say 40%, 40% on <laughs> Buckner and then 30% each on, on uh, Simpson and Milrow. I, wow. I, I think it will be a very – uh, close competition. I'm not so sure, Mark, and again, this is just me covering the program uh, on a regular basis. I don't think a starter will be named during fall camp. I could be wrong. I wouldn't be surprised if the starter wasn't 
named until the week of the first game. It wouldn't surprise me if they didn't do a uh, – if they didn't name a starter at all, if they did that and, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so. And it wouldn't shock me if they played more than one quarterback in the first game against Middle Tennessee with the idea of, you know, we're going to see how these guys play in the game. And then, you know, the next week against Texas really have – by that point, zero it in on one guy because you don't want to be running multiple guys out there against Texas. But I think this thing is going to linger through fall camp. I think that Saban and Reese want to give every one of these guys a fair shot. And I think the fact that they brought in Buckner and, and Milrow and uh, Simpson both are coming back to compete in the fall tells you that they believe that they have a chance to start. I think coming out of spring camp, if either one of those guys had thought they had no shot, uh, one or both would have gotten the portal. And that's that's the world that we live in now. But I think all three of these guys understand it's a competition. And, Mark, I believe that all three believe that they're going to be the starters. So that sets up for a great competition. Let them get out there. Let them compete. And I trust that Nick Saban and Tommy Reese will find the best guy. Is Simpson supposed to be the best thrower? Well, I think that, uh, yeah, probably. I, I think if you just looked at three of them, you said who's the best pure passer? I think probably most people here would say it's Ty Simpson. I think obviously Milrose, you know, a freakish athlete. He clearly would be the best athlete and the best runner. But Buckner is a good athlete, too. And as a combination, as far as being an efficient passer and also being able to use his legs, he's probably the best combination uh, of the three. So, again, all of them have strengths. They're all very talented players. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting because – you know, we haven't had this in a while here uh, as far as a true quarterback competition. I guess you'd have to go back to 2016, um, you know, when Jalen Hurts was a true freshman, but they went into that season. Oh, help me out, Mark, with a kid who wound up transferring out. Uh, oh, during the USC bad. game, he got pulled. Yeah. Uh, hmm. <laughs> was, you know, pegged to be the guy. Oh, uh, shoot. 17 years right out of high school, Blake Barnett. Blake Barnett. Yes. But Blake Barnett started the first game, then Jalen came in, and it was his for the rest of his uh, freshman season. And then he started 17, and then, of course, he got pulled in the national championship game. But still, you knew you had Jalen. You knew you had Tua. Uh, Even after Tua got hurt, the way that Mac played, you felt good about him in 2020. And you mentioned Bryce Young. Bryce Young would have played more in 2020 had it not been an SEC-only schedule and the COVID and all that. But you're you're 100% right. Everybody knew going into 2021 that Bryce Young was the guy. So it's been a long time since we've gone into fall, as you alluded to at the top, with this many quarterback questions. But I think in some ways it's exciting. I think I think that the, the football team um, as a whole sees this kind of as a start-over type year with, you know, Will Anderson Jr. gone, with Bryce Young gone, uh, kind of turning the page. They haven't won a national championship now in a couple of years. So I think there's a lot of renewal and enthusiasm and a lot of position battles, not just the quarterback. But I think obviously quarterback is the focus. And But I think all these players, from what I saw in spring, are looking forward to kind of, you know, building on this program and this dynasty with kind of a start over. Hey, we're our own team. All of these players that won national championships, for the most part, are gone. And we can kind of start over, and that, that includes the quarterbacks. Gary Harris, sports director, WVUA, and also the Gary Harris Show on Tide 100.9. And, of course, what's going to help out the quarterback uh, more than anything except the offensive line would be wide receiver play. And it was just such a stark contrast when we saw those four great wide receivers play together that were all first-round picks over that two- or three-year stretch um, to see substandard play at that position the last couple of seasons. Where do you think that wide receiver role stands right now? Well, I think it's going to be better than it was last year. You know, you're right. You had, uh, my gosh, you had, you know, Mari Cooper, R- Ridley, and then you had the four first rounders that you mentioned with Ruggs and Judy and and Waddle and uh, that Devontae Smith guy. Devontae Smith, and and then you you know even with them they were gone. You had Mechie and Jamison Williams who were phenomenal, and and then last year. Um, you know, you didn't you didn't really have that type of quarterback play. Now, you you had some talent. You had some guys that flashed. Obviously, DeCorey Brooks, the, the hero of the of the 2021 Iron Bowl. Uh, Jermaine Burton came in. They both had big plays, but, you know, they, they weren't consistent. You had some really talented freshmen that flashed. But this year, you've got Malik Benson coming in, the top wide receiver out of the junior college prospects. 
uh, out of the junior college ranks. And then again, you've got Prentice and Bond and, and Law, like I said, freshmen that all flash. So they've got numbers. They've got talent. They've got speed. They've got bigger receivers. They can be possession guys. I mean, they got a, a lot of different type wide receivers that on paper, it looks pretty good. But as far as production, yeah, they have not had a guy step up to say, hey, I'm the number one. I'm a potential first round draft pick. So I think that the wide receiving group as a whole is pretty talented, but it's much like the quarterbacks from the standpoint that it's just not proven to be the same level that Alabama has been accustomed to. So we'll see. George has been so great the last two years, but you know, this team was four minutes away from a national championship two years ago and lost to the last play of the game twice last year. Is it really much been lost in this program? I know that the national narrative is that Georgia is so far ahead of everyone and Alabama's lost something and maybe Saban's lost his fastball, but is it really that far from what it's been? I don't think so, Mark. I, I think it's overreactionary on the uh, basis that, you know, everybody's wanted to see Alabama kind of, you know, uh, go down a little bit. And listen, it's just 2021 when Alabama was – thumping Georgia in that SEC championship game. We're not talking about just winning the game. We're talking about thoroughly beat a beatdown against a team that was a big favorite and undefeated. Yes, they had to turn around and play in the national championship game, but it's easy to forget there that they had no John Mechie. Jameson Williams went down in the first half. Still, Alabama's got the lead, you know, midway through the fourth quarter. And, you know, and I had the ball with a chance to go down and, and have a touchdown and two-point conversion to force overtime, and the pick six made it a 15-point game. But that was a very competitive game. And, in fact, you know, Stetson Bennett is going to be so fondly remembered, and rightfully so. But if you look at that national championship game, Mark, he was really the same Stetson Bennett he'd have been, he'd have been, against, uh, he'd been against Alabama in the SEC championship game through three quarters. The difference was in the fourth quarter, yes, he made some huge plays. But that's how close Alabama was to winning the national championship that year. And then last season, as you said, uh, two losses literally on the final play of the game at Tennessee, a game Alabama, frankly, should have won and uh, could have won. Got a very questionable interference call. And then on that last drive, you know, uh, Gibbs drops a pass that if he catches, he might still be running. They missed the field goal. And then inexplicably in 15 seconds, Tennessee's able to go 40 plus yards down the field and kick a field goal in the last play of the game to win it. And then the LSU game, they certainly could have won. So uh, I know there were other games that they could have lost. But my point is, no, Alabama's not that far away. It's not like 2021. And, you know, as you know, for a lot of programs, if you win the SEC championship and you play for a national title, you know, they're having parades for that. For Alabama, it was a disappointment. And then last year, to not make the playoff is downright shocking. But I, I see this team as a playoff caliber team. Now, will they get in? You know, who knows? But certainly they're, in my opinion, Mark, still one of the three or four most talented teams in the country. And, um, you know, maybe right now they are a little bit behind Georgia. But, um, you know, we'll see if Alabama can get to Atlanta. They may get a chance to play the Bulldogs again in the SEC championship game. And if they can get in the playoff, they may play them yet even again. So I don't think they're that far off, no. I certainly don't think the sky's falling. After an, after, after an 11 and two season and a, and a blowout no. in the Sugar Bowl over Kansas State, I, I think they're okay. Yeah, they're, they are okay. And anyone that looks at the recruiting rankings, you know what the deal is. We're, we're in June, and uh, I think uh, eight commits and three or five stars, and they're, they're rising through the rankings, and they'll be where they need to be there as well. Yeah, just keep on rolling. That's something. As long as Nick Saban is the head coach here, I don't care if, you know, when he got here when he was 56 or now that he's 71 going on 72. Uh, he'll quit doing the job when he feels he can't do the job, Mark. As long as he's the head coach here, Alabama's going to recruit. He he is the standard. He is the model that, whether it's Kirby Smart or Steve Sarkeesian or all, Lane Kiffin, all these coaches around the country, they use the Nick Saban model when it comes to recruiting. He's He's the best I've ever seen as a head football coach in terms of recruiting. It is the Gary Harris Show, Tide 100.9, also the sports director there at WVUA in Tuscaloosa. Gary, we always appreciate the time. Appreciate you stopping by, sir. I appreciate it. My pleasure is always working. Again, I hate that the camera didn't work, but but listen, we got probably better to not have to see me yapping and just get to hear me. So I enjoyed it.